Hello, everyone. This is Zayami Echelzerwin from FilmFestivalCircuit.com and the assistant director of the Oregon Short Film Festival. We are gearing up for our spring 2023 session, which is going to be on May 29th at the beautiful, historic Clinton Street Theater. And today I'm talking to a participating filmmaker, Frank Woodward, uh, who is the director of What Does It Eat? Frank, thank you so much for meeting with me. Thanks for having me on. This is great. So tell us, what, uh, just you know, loosely, what is What Does It Eat about? Well, What Does It Eat is, uh, is a micro short, and it's really about a daughter who receives a present for her, her mother that is extremely perplexing. And I will leave it at that. <laughs> That's pretty Perfect. much what it is. Uh, so what inspired you uh, to make this movie? It's, it's, it's unique. What, what inspired you behind this? Uh, you know, I, as a filmmaker, I tried to always be making something. And uh, my DP, uh, Mike Mogadam, and I have been chatting about, we have all these tools, let's just make something, even if it's just a little short two-minute piece. Okay. Um, so I've been really enamored with the idea of doing really short subjects, like, like, like I said, the micro shorts, uh, just for the sake of being able to flex the muscles. And the same way an actor does acting class, they get to act someplace. With film, it's a little harder, but I think that's why a lot of us are driven towards short films. So that's what was kind of the motivating factor. I had an idea that seemed like we could do it in a short, inexpensive way, um, and it ended up uh, getting a lot of attention. People seem to really like it. Okay, totally. Well, it is. Uh, it's it's nice. This is a micro short that I feel uh, operates in in kind of a uh, weird, like a, almost like a, a poetic vein. This is like a little two sentence thing. But it, it's 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 got an interesting pace. It's got an interesting feel. Do you want to talk at all about uh, how you got that idea, or maybe anything about uh, the costuming for 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 the perplexing character? Well, the costuming for the perplexing character uh, for when people finally see it, without revealing too much about right. what's what's in the box, uh, <laughs> we uh, we had a choice of deciding whether or not to go extremely realistic uh, or just going for cheapness or, or or kind of like uh just really goofy fun with it and we opted to go with that in fact in general the whole idea of what does it eat was to be more fun okay um and i'm a horror writer i deal with horror stuff and a lot of that tends to be very bleak when you're writing it just by the nature of the genre and even though i love monsters and i love to do something that's more fantastical whenever i do a project I was like, eh, you know, maybe we'll try something a little bit more silly. Okay, yeah. Uh, and silliness was what was driving us for this piece, which is also why we, with the costuming, when people finally do get to see it, they'll notice we don't even attempt at reality. Right. Uh, and I don't think we need it. I don't think anybody misses it. And, and that was a big question on set even. Like when we were there, we were putting things together. We were, I turned to my crew and I was like, should we make this look more real and they're like no it works like it is don't even bother and i think they were right totally well it has this it has this kind of surreal charm uh through that i think no, that, yeah that, yeah you would lose uh, otherwise um i want you know this is this is clearly you're flexing your muscles this is a two minute thing yeah. you were writing in a slightly different vein i'm wondering did you uh, take anything away from this process did you learn anything i i the thing i took away from it i think is is right now with audiences I think we're tired of bleakness. I think we're tired of uh, lessons or I think people who want to see films, it's not that those films don't have a place. It's not that people aren't making brilliant films with that kind of a tone. Uh, but I think that I'm finding people are responding th to films that are positive, that are fun, that have a happy ending, if you will. Not that it has to be all sugar and spice and everything nice, but it's something that doesn't make you go oh my god we've had enough of that over the last few right years. okay uh, totally yeah and i and i've been finding more the pieces that people respond to even the things in the theater that people go see tend to be things that just make the, it's the escapism of film again okay uh, yeah i think it's come back and i think that's going to be and not, and then but i don't think we've lost a sense for wanting something that feels personal or has some sort of uh, character behind it i'm not saying everything is because Marvel films are escapism, right? But I, you know, and those work. But I think it's more about just being up as opposed to down. 
Okay. Which is a really, really bad saying when I say it out loud, but I'll, I'll go with it. <laughs> hey, it's a, it, it works as a mantra in, in a pinch. <laughs> well, you know, and, and uh, that makes sense because, uh, um, you know, in a similar way, uh, you know, to a, a down movie, your up movie still has that, has that bizarre quality. You're still thinking like, well, what's going on? You know, there, there is a question there. You don't answer all, all you don't check all the boxes for, for, you know, satisfying questions. And I think that that gives it some merit. It's, it's a serene film, but it doesn't end on, on, on pure peachy. You're still wondering what's going on, you know? Well, yeah, I, I think so. I, I think that's also too. I, I think one thing that we're also, we don't, we're, we're as audiences, I think we want to be able to figure some things out for ourselves. We like to participate in the story. Okay. Yeah. It doesn't mean that as a writer, you should have gaping holes in your logic or your plot. But um, I think it was Billy Wilder who said that if you, uh, if you could tell the audience, I'm, I'm paraphrasing horribly, <laughs> tell the audience that two plus two equals four, but if you let them figure it out for themselves, they'll love you forever. Right. <laughs> and uh, really badly paraphrasing Billy Wilder there, so forgive me, folks. But that I think that's true. I think there's a lot, there's an audience participation that we all used to do, whether it be suspension of disbelief. Um, I mean, Case in point, a Godzilla movie where the suits are definitely not believable. Right. People love Godzilla films because we showed up and we were like, you know what? I know that's rubber, but I'm going with it. Totally. And it makes you part of the process. And I think audiences enjoy that a lot more. That's that's a, a very keen insight. That's something to really take away, especially in the independent field. People are always striving to hit the markers of uh, AAA top tier production. But there is something extremely rewarding with that imaginative element, you know, we're kind of kids again, we suspend our disbelief. We're now participating. We're now playing the game and it's, it's quite fun. Yeah. It, it's, it's kind of, there's a phrase I've been playing with on, on, on a documentary I'm developing right now called the art of limitations. Mm -hmm. And it's, it doesn't just apply to filmmakers having to figure out how they're going to tell a story with limited funds or limited uh, resources. It's also about the audience and the things that, Think of Jaws. You didn't see the shark for most of the film. Right. There was a limitation for why you didn't when they were making it, but also by not showing us the shark and had us participate. And what we imagine happened under the water when Christy gets eaten at the beginning of the film is much worse than anything they could have shown in 1975. Totally. No, by, absolutely. And by having given us that limitation of like, we're not going to show you everything. You have to fill in the blank. I think that's when cinema is much more participatory. And, and I think that's what we as audiences respond to. Now things are kind of done all for us. The The downside of CGI is it just does all the imagining for us, right. all the reality for us. We don't have to see through the wires or see through the blue screen. We just, we get it in hyper realism. So we don't have to mentally do any work. Totally. So I think that that's something that people, I think that's also why, like, like younger generations, younger than myself, I'm an old fart, <laughs> but um, they really respect the films of the '80s, which were still working with practical. Right. Absolutely. You know, and and you, they had to shoot them a certain way, and, it, and there was a certain thing they had stuff they had to hide, but that made it feel more real. Right. There's a different pace, a different cadence to when you have to. Uh obscure certain details certain elements and i think it's it's really pleasing people are getting back into it uh you are of course are making uh stuff in that vein i'm curious you mentioned a, a documentary do you want to expand on any other stuff you're working on yeah I, i'm there's two different documentaries i'm working on one of them uh is a lot further out before we start filming on it which is called the art of limitations which we just talked about a little bit that's kind of the thrust of that documentary which okay. is very dear to my heart as a filmmaker because I think we are at our best when we have to figure out a way to creatively tell a story uh, as opposed to having all the money and all the tools at our fingerprints. Totally. Uh, fingerprints. Um, but the other documentary I'm working on is a, is entirely different. I think in that from, from art of limitations, I'm doing a documentary about a uh, Disney legend and Imagineer Bob Gurr. Bob is a 91-year-old man who was is the last surviving Imagineer who built Disneyland alongside Walt Disney. Oh, wow. We're doing a documentary about this man who's 91 years old, he's still going around the world having fun, discovering things, <laughs> and, and loving life, and 
his his career and where he came from is rooted in that kind of exploration of himself and of the world around him. And I think it's going to be very uh, inspirational for people to see him living part of his life. We get to witness that within a week of his life. Awesome. These sound fascinating. Yeah, are, are you planning on these uh, as a feature length or, or half hour? Yeah, the, uh, they're both going to be feature length. I've done a couple of documentaries uh, before. There's one on H.P. Lovecraft and one another one called Men in Suits about like the Godzilla actors that we're talking about. Okay. Uh, so I haven't done a documentary for a while because it's hard to find a topic that somebody isn't already doing on YouTube. Right. <laughs> uh, especially if you're a pop culture driven guy like myself. Right. So it, it took me a while to find something that I was really excited about and the Bob Gurr documentary, uh, we were fortunate that he was, look, he and his his uh, manager were looking to do something that was a little bit different in presenting his body of work and his mm. philosophies on, on creation and life. And we were able to find something that he responded to. And we've been shooting that now for the last couple of weeks. Excellent. Well, uh, is there anything else you'd like to add about what does it eat? <laughs> I'll, I'll hope, come and see it and you'll see what it does eat. But I, I <laughs> it's, uh, I hope people enjoy it just for the sheer silliness of it all, because that's why we made it. We made it with that spirit of silliness. We're very flattered that it's it's done so well with film festivals, and I'm hoping it will do well with a live audience when we up in Oregon, uh, because uh, it's we didn't expect the response to be the way it's been, and we're very very humbled and flattered by it because for us it was just a bit of fun. And maybe that comes across. Maybe that's why people like it. Absolutely. Well, I'm I'm very excited to put it on uh, the big screen. It's two minutes. It's short and sweet, but it, it leaves a lasting impact uh, on May 29th at the Clint Street Theater. Uh, thank you so much for talking with me, and uh, I hope to see you uh, very soon. Well, looking forward to it. See ya.